Hello, once again, this is a blessing and a privilege uh, to be before you, to all of our Pleasant Green Church family, and to all of our listeners. Uh, peace and the love of God rest and rule among you. This is Lesson 9, January the 30th, 2022. It is still from Unit 2, God, the Source of Justice. And the title for our Sunday School lesson is Countercultural Compassion. That is a mouthful in itself. Our devotional reading is from the book of Luke, the ninth chapter, verses 1 through 17. Our background scripture is from Deuteronomy, the 24th chapter, verses 10 through, 24, through 21, which is also our printed passage. Deuteronomy 24, verses 10 through 21. And our key verse is, Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. This is why I command you to do this. That's uh, the 18th verse of the 24th chapter of Deuteronomy. And our lesson's aims are explore God's standards for justice. Appreciate how God loves those who are poor and marginalized. And share love with those who are rejected by others. Uh, our lesson uh, has three different sections. Uh, the first is titled, Lender Beware. That would be verses 10 through 13. And our second part of our lesson is Workers Compensation and Family Preservation. Verses 14 through 18. And then our last section is titled a Provision for the Marginalized. And those would be verses 19 through 21. So our lesson starts out uh, in the introduction, it defines and it explains uh, the title of the lesson, Countercultural Compassion. And uh, I would like to just read uh, word for word you know, what it says. It, it's impactful. And it... Uh, it it really uh, gives us a contrast and a comparison uh, that we need to focus on. So it reads, This lesson's title is Countercultural Compassion. Just what does that mean in the context of God's requirement for justice? Countercultural is an adjective describing a subculture whose lifestyles or values reject or oppose the dominant values and behavior of society. Compassion is a sympathetic awareness of others' distress together with the desire to alleviate it. In this context, 
Countercultural compassion is the action of those within the dominant culture to oppose the denial of social justice for the distressed, the marginalized. In this apt description of believers, a subculture with values opposed to those of the world, the world oppresses the powerless because of race, ethnicity, economic status, and often their religious affiliations. I'm going to stop right there. And I think it is uh, worthy and beneficial for us to uh, focus upon this message in the lesson coming from God to a people whom have been oppressed and suppressed. And because of a condition imposed upon them by a majority group. Uh, this was not an edit that was declared or decreed from them from God, for it was God who led to their freedom from the suppression and the oppression of an order established by people. So, when we look at this, we recognize that because of what they had experienced, God does not send this decree to the so-called dominant culture we would think that there would be a higher expectation and requirement of a dominant culture who, according to their own accreditation, have grouped a people together as less than themselves. According to their own value system, has decreed a people as not being their equal or not being worthy of the other accesses to opportunities that the so-called dominant culture was experiencing. So, but when we look at this, the message in Deuteronomy is not to Egypt, but it is to the Hebrews. It is to Israel. And even though they may con be considered to be a subculture, the requirement that would be expected of a dominant culture or of a uh, lack of a better term so-called superior culture the requirement is asked of a culture that is absent from the totality of the so-called dominant culture and the smaller group the marginalized group, the discriminated group, is asked to do something that should be done by the dominant culture. For if these requirements that are asked of Israel had been done by Egypt, then the suppression of Israel would not have been. But instead, God asked Israel, since you have gone through this suppression, since you have experienced this oppression, since you have been wrongfully treated as less 
then human, I request of you to demonstrate and to practice and to exemplify the things that should be done by all cultures. So when we look at the beginning, says lender, beware. And the text says, when you make a loan of any kind to your neighbor, do not go into their house to get what is offered to you as a pledge. Stay outside and let the neighbor to whom you are making the loan bring the pledge out to you. If the neighbor is poor, do not go to sleep with the pledge in your possession. Don't let the sun go down with you holding what belongs to the poor. Return the cloak by sunset so that your neighbor may sleep in it. Then they will thank you and it will be regarded as a righteous act in the sight of the Lord your God. What is God requiring here? And what principles is God establishing? There is a sense of God protecting the dignity and the respect of those considered less than the poor, the discriminated, the segregated, and the marginalized. So God here says, if someone whom is poor, if they have to just, uh, if they have to sometimes humiliate themselves just to ask for a loan. If they have to belittle themselves to ask for resources they need to accommodate just basic essentials in their life. It says to the lender, don't you become larger than life. Don't you display an attitude and a behavior that belittles the person who is already hum humiliated by having to have to ask you for a need. So it was a practice when uh, those who were in need uh, would have to ask someone to borrow something to show that they were sincere about repaying what they borrowed. They would have to give up something of need of their own. They would have to uh, release uh, some of their own possessions, the very little that they had. They would have to take the less that they already were experiencing and give of that to someone else to let them know you can hold this as proof that I will pay you back. And so uh, what God said is when they have made that humiliating sacrifice, don't you be so proud that you will hold on to it knowing that this is something that they need. Don't be a part of the process of continued humiliation of the person, but take that which they gave as a pledge that upon my word, I will pay you back what I borrowed. And in the meantime, you can hold this possession of mine as proof that I mean what I say. But it said for the lender, don't hold on to it for two or three days if it requires them that amount of time. Take it back to them so that 
you don't add to the humiliation and belittling of themselves. Don't you add stress that they are already experiencing. Don't you compound the stress by putting pressure on them and taking something you know that they need, but you take pride in holding it and saying, I'll keep it until they give me what I lend it to them. So God is saying to those that have been blessed, first of all, every good and perfect gift comes from above. So even the one who are temporarily holding on to the wealth that God has blessed them with, it really doesn't belong to them in the first place. It was only given to them uh, for the time that they are in possession of it. But when they leave, it will go to someone else anyway because it really never was theirs in the first place. They were granted it, and the blessing is if they were good stewards of it, wow, God blessed them to hold on to it. And did they share the blessing that was given to them as God shared the wealth for the cattle on a thousand hills still belongs to the Lord. And while God gave of what God created to others, did we possess it and then give it to those in need? Now, upon that, um, I know we're speaking out of Deuteronomy, the Old Testament. And this uh, verse that uh, I'm being led uh, to, to bring into the lesson, uh, I'm certain that um, it, it also uh, passes on uh, to other verses. But this would be a good time to bring it in as well. Uh, because uh, it talks it talks about uh, giving to the poor, and in your leisure, if you will read the twenty fifth chapter of Matthew, the twenty fifth chapter of Matthew, and you can begin at the thirty first verse and read all the way through to the forty sixth. And I'm just going to try to capsulize it for time's sake. But Christ was teaching uh, about um, uh, the king. And, and when the king would return, is talking about when the Son of Man comes in his glory. And these were some guidelines that were going to separate the sheep and the goat. And so... Christ gives them this parable, and he says that uh, when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. Uh, I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed and, and fed you or thirsty and we gave you drink. And when did we see you a stranger and we took you in or naked and we clothed you? Or, or when did we see you sick or in prison and we came to you? And Christ told them that the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as as you have done it to the least, to one of the least of these, my brethren and sisters, you have done it also unto me. And as we look at this scripture, uh, we should bathe our thoughts in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. Now, the workers' compensation and family preservation. Uh, it speaks of how we are to treat uh, workers. 
Uh, it said, uh, do not take advantage of a hired worker who is poor and needy. Whether that worker is a fellow Israelite or a foreigner residing in one of your towns. Pay them their wages each day before sunset. Because they are poor and are counting on it, otherwise they may cry to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty of sin. And parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sin. Uh, that cancels out this uh, generational curse and being punished for what my father did or uh, being punished for what my dad or my mom or for what my daughter or my son did. Um, uh, it goes on to say, do not deprive the foreigner or the fatherless of justice. Don't take advantage of people who, because they are not a part of the major group, the dominant group, don't take advantage of them. If they're fatherless, if they are orphans, that doesn't give us an opportunity to treat them unjustly simply because they don't have a household simply because they're not from a uh, structured uh, family. They don't have a father or, or mother that is present. Uh, if anything, it would appear that we would try to make even available to them even more so opportunities and resources to assist them since they don't have a father or a mother. It says, take the cloak of the widow. It says, or, uh, speaking of don't deprive, it says, don't take the coat of the widow as a pledge. Remember your past. Remember your bondage in Egypt. And the Lord redeemed you. So if you see others suffering, be a part of redemption and do what you can to redeem others from the same oppression that you felt. So when we look at this part, uh, saying don't take advantage of a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether the worker is a fellow Israelite or a foreigner residing in one of your towns, uh, pay them their wages each day before sunset. As I was reading through this, it came to mind uh, out of the book of Matthew again, and this is the uh, 20th chapter of Matthew, uh, verses 2 through 16. So Matthew, the 20th chapter, uh, verses 2 through 16. And uh, again, Christ, the masterful teacher, uh, taught another parable. This here was called the parable of the laborers. And uh, he describes it in this manner. In the first verse, he says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And the story goes, and in again in your leisure read through it, the story goes he went to the marketplace and he found available workers, physically available. They were uh, capable workers and they were standing idle although they were physically and capable uh, and able to perform certain work assignments they were standing idle and he looked upon them and he asked a group of them to come and work in his vineyard for a denarius or for a penny 
And the story goes on, and it says, uh, and then he went back in the uh, third hour. He went back in the sixth hour, and he went back in the went back in the ninth hour, and then in the eleventh hour, and he was still calling viable workers that were standing idle in the marketplace. And he was calling them to come and work in his vineyard. And he made a promise to all of them for a penny. And towards the end of the day, remember the text said, don't let the sun set before you pay the workers their wages. And so he came to pay the well, uh, the workers and he began with the workers that he had just hired. And so as they were coming through to receive their pay, he gave them the penny. And the workers who had started out at the beginning of the day, they felt that uh, they were taken advantage of. They felt that uh, we should be receiving more if these workers just came and uh, they uh, received the same amount that we received and we started at the beginning of the day and they've only been here for an hour and yet they're receiving the same amount. And Christ explained to them that have I done any wrong to you? Didn't we agree on the pay, you agreed to receive a penny for your day's labor. And I did pay you what we agreed to. I also promised that to the workers who came at the third, the sixth, the ninth, and the eleventh hour. And I have not gone back on my word to anyone, but I have made available to everyone the wealth that we agreed I would share. And such as it is, many times we view what God has given to us to be less if we think someone else has received the same amount but they did less. We think we should be compensated more if we've been toiling and if we've been in this uh, journey for a longer period of time, then my pay should exceed that of someone else who just came a few minutes ago. Not recognizing that all through the journey, all through the process, I recognize that God had blessed me with more than just monetary reward. But I recognize that I had certain capabilities that I had been blessed with, and I was able to utilize those and see the wealth and the worth of what I had been given. And so in the journey, there are blessings in many different measures and dimensions. But a lot of times we focus on just what, according to the standards of the day, we focus on the monetary value, things that are tangible more so than the things that are innate and that emanate from within by the creator who fearfully and wonderfully made us. Now, another thing we need to look at here is, is think about the thief that was on the side of Christ on the day of sacrifice and crucifixion. He recognized that he had not lived a life 
worthy of being acknowledged. But he also understood that this man has done no wrong and we are we are duty bound to the uh, consequences of our actions. We have not lived according to the requirements of God. But this man hasn't done anything and is not to be punished in the manner equal to what we are receiving. But listen to what Christ says to him. This day you shall be with me in paradise. Now, Christ didn't make a distinction about all the other saints that he knew were coming that had lived portions of their life in submission to the will of God. And some may have done it for 10 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, the years that God had granted unto them when they chose to submit their lives to the will of God. This man did it right before his last breath. And yet the same reward that was afforded to those who have been on the battlefield for years was given to him in a moment. But because he received the same blessing that was given to him in a moment, how did that deprive any of us of the same blessing that is still awaiting us? Since we said earlier that the cattle on a thousand hills belongs unto God, how is it that what God gives to somebody else deprives me of what God has already given to me and still promised me more? But we live in a so-called dominant culture that makes distinctions, economic distinctions, depriving many the scripture was telling us about not to deprive uh, orphans or fatherless children, uh, not to deprive widows and such. But we live in a so-called dominant culture that, that uh, uh, praises itself, recognizing it has an inequality in its economic system where people who are a uh, burden with carrying the load of the culture, receiving the less or receiving the least. But they should read uh, that lesson as well to see in the end what is the real reward. Now we close with the last part of our lesson. And it tells us, and we have experienced this. Uh, our four parents experienced this. My, my dad took me down south uh, to Mississippi, to Aberdeen. Um, and um, uh, we visited some of uh, my people's uh, land. And as my cousins were we were walking from one farm to another we stopped at a watermelon patch and my cousin said do you want some watermelon and I said oh man yeah it's hot he said oh man this is going to be one of the best watermelons you've had and he reached down and punched the watermelon and took a clunk of it out and just began to eat it and he said go ahead get you one this is Uncle So-and-So's farm. And I was told how that in the South, and, and we always refer to it as Southern hospitality. But I was told how one family, if they uh, didn't have as much land, didn't have the same crops as another member, 
uh, in their travels down the dirt roads, they could stop and they could take a patch of greens or sweet potatoes or what they needed to feed themselves. And they never took more than they need. They didn't, they didn't hoard. They didn't bring like a big container and act like it was going out of style or something. They had to get as much as they possibly could, could uh, gather. They only took what they needed for their families. So in the closing of our lesson, it talks about provision for the marginalized. And it said, when you are harvesting in the field, and you overlook a sheaf. Do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. So that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olives from your trees. Do not go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner, for the fatherless, and for the widow. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the foreigner, for the fatherless, and for the widow. We certainly hope and pray that something was said that gives us uh, insight into what God's expectations are of us. And then most assuredly, we hope that what we've learned compels us to be doers of God's word and not just hearers alone. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.